Chapter One of Mad Barbara. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Mad Barbara by Warwick Deeping. Chapter One. In the little music house in his garden overlooking the park of St. James's, Sir Lionel Purcell, knight, lay dead, with his cloak half thrown across his face, and one hand still gripping the hilt of his sword. The door of the music room stood ajar, giving a glimpse of the autumn garden, the grass silvered with heavy dew, yellow leaves flaking it, like splashes of gold on a green shield. The curtains were drawn across the windows, so that a few stray shafts of light alone streamed in giving a sense of some mystery unrevealed as yet, some riddle of human passion waiting to be read. The silent room seemed all shadows, save where those Rem Rembrandtesque strands of sunlight slanted upon the floor, and there, as though touched by light from another world, the dead man's forehead gleamed out above the black folds of his cloak. His sword, a streak of silver, joined him to the surrounding shadows, a last bond between him and the past. Without, an autumn morning, with the clocks chiming the hour of six, and the waterfowl calling from the decoy in the park. A golden mist swimming in the east, the grass white with dew, the trees still sleeping, though the yellow leaves fell slowly, softly from the silent branches overhead a virginal grey-eyed wonder in the eyes of the day. Freshness and fragrance everywhere, with the spires of Westminster striking upward into pearly haze, and the broad river catching the sunlight that sifted through the ragged vapour. Dawn may be the egotist's hour of smug self-congratulation, or the poet's moment for praising solitude, even though, like Thompson, he buries his head in a nightcap, and wallows in bed till noon the dead man had no one as yet to question his quietude though there was a sense of stirring everywhere attic windows opening milk frothing into jugs at kitchen steps carts lumbering lazily over the cobbles the sun ascended the mist began to rise the sunflowers in a row along the wall had their broad faces made splendid by the day a couple of thrushes were hopping to and fro over the grass an inquisitive robin came perking in through the half-shut door to stand twittering with one black beady eye cocked curiously at the motionless figure on the floor in one dark corner a harpsichord showed the ivory of its keyboard with something suggestive of a sinister smile had that ingenious connoisseur of feminine beauty mr pepys taken an early stroll in the park that morning he might have derived infinite contentment from the sight of a young girl a comely black wench standing at her open window with nothing but a red cloak to hide the whiteness of her night-gear she was binding her hair her eyes gazing over the empty park a little table at the window beside her full of ribbons pins trinkets and laces she was wondering whether her father would walk early in the park that morning she had fallen asleep before he had returned from supping at my lord montague's the night before though mrs jael her mother's woman had sat up to watch for the flare of links along the street the garden looked innocent enough in the morning sunlight with its gravel walks sleek grass and quaint bay trees trimmed into the likeness of pinnacles the music-room with its diminutive classic portico lyre mask and trumpets in gilt upon the tympanum seemed with its white pillars no place where tragedy might watch and wait whatever impulse drew the girl to the music-room that autumn morning she had caught no prophetic gleam of the thing that waited to be known a few steps across the grass a moment's surprise at finding the door ajar a startled pause upon the threshold then the lights and shadows of that rembrandtesque interior burning themselves in upon the brain the limning of that motionless figure in lines of fire against a background of imperishable memories that he was dead 
a touch of the hand betrayed without one moment's hope the reason of his death blazoned in gules with a red rose over the heart the face set in a smile of infinite sadness an overturned candle with the wax spilled upon the table a bowl of flowers broken upon the floor and in the left hand held by the stiff fingers a short chain of gold with a knot of pearls for a button like a loop torn from a man's cloak it was thus that barbara purcell child that she yet was found her father lying dead with a sword thrust through the heart he had been a silent man no courtier a man whose life had hoped more from the quiet corners of the world than from the pageantry of state he had had no enemies so far as the child knew yet the world might have warned her that a man may be grudged the possession of a handsome wife even the bible might have told her that as for the short curb of gold with its knot of pearls she took it from the dead hand and hid the thing in her bosom under her dress to blazon the truth abroad to run shrieking into the house that was not the way the passion of her grief expressed itself the curb of gold was the one link that might join the future to the past she would show it to no one that right should be hers to watch and to discover End of chapter 1chapter two of mad barbara by warwick deeping this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two listen she touched his shoulder suddenly and their eyes met in a questioning stare the eyes of two people who have some secret to be guarded i heard someone in the gallery a coach stopped in the yard two minutes ago it is barbara come home the girl moves about like a ghost they drew aside from each other my lord bland buxom imposing in periwig and black coat broidered with gold my lady plump luscious yet a little furtive about the eyes her flowered gown in green and blue pleated into a hundred folds over her camlet petticoat she wore her dark hair low upon her neck with a rose over the left ear and a mass of exquisite lace upon her bosom lord stephen gore cleared his throat and began speaking with discreet distinctness on some wholly impersonal topic the pair were decorously distant when the door of the great parlour opened the man standing at the window as though watching the people passing in the street beneath the woman seated almost primly in a high-backed chair a book in her lap mild apathy upon her face my lord at the window turned on his heel abruptly as though he had just become aware of the presence of a third person in the room he was a man of poise of genial aplomb one of those complacent gods who are never out of countenance or at a loss for a trick of the tongue the girl's eyes seemed to sweep from one to the other with a momentary gleam of distrust she still wore her mourning a gown of plain black velvet with a circle of lace at the throat the expression on her face was one of tired nonchalance but for that evanescent gleam of the eye she might have passed as a bloodless and languid girl whose vitality lacked the stimulus of perfect health my lord met her with a bow that expressed unnecessary condescension he had reached an age where it is possible to be fatherly and even officious in a frank twinkling stately fashion and how is my persephone still in the pensive droops and yet mr herrick preaches the gathering of roses he put forward a chair for her with the tolerance of an amiable gentleman of the world she took it without thanking him her cold colourless face masking an instinctive repulsion an impatience that his urbanity seemed fated to inspire the lord and the lady exchanged glances it was as though the girl had brought a frost with her into the midst of june her silence and her almost sullen apathy embarrassed them it was like being in the presence of a statue that had eyes and ears but no tongue anne purcell clapped her book too and jerked it aside on to an oak table where did you drive in the park drive good lack girl are you torpid i could swear you have not noticed the colour of a gown or the set of a hat 
one might as well send out a mummy she glanced unconcernedly at the buckles on my lord's shoes the park yes a great business there to see and to be seen enough dust to stifle one and too many people the words were the perfunctory words of one who would rather have remained silent her face seemed vacant and expressionless my lord drew in a deep breath through his nostrils and regarded her with philosophic pity Ahem, holy gemini dust and ashes at two and twenty he nodded his head benignantly yet with a cynical curving of the mouth while the plump well-complexioned mother studied her bantling with irritable contempt there was some inherent antipathy between these two their attitude was one of vague distrust as though the sun and the moon found themselves in miraculous juxtaposition at midday you had better go to bed girl you look tired enough she met her mother's hard inquisitive stare and seemed to stiffen at it with a sensitive hatred of being watched no i am not tired fiddlesticks my lord held up a bland white hand ruffled in mechlin immaculate to the fingertips let her alone anne these feather moods need a south wind his lofty compunction repelled her more than her mother's brusque contempt the atmosphere of the room seemed overburdened with a sensuous flavour the very roses suggested a rank and vivid worldliness a fulsomeness of the flesh gotten of meat and wine she rose pushing back her chair with a languid drooping of the lids tell jael to have supper sent to my room shall you be late to-night her face was turned toward her mother as though the gentleman in the periwig were a mere negligible shadow go to bed child and don't trouble your head about healthy people nell is at the king's to-night i wish you could catch some of the wench's devil oh the dreary lame woman i have seen her at her window in her night-dress shouting at moll davis in the next house she looks something of a drab with her hair done up in papers do the candles make such a difference she looked listlessly over her shoulder at my lord her lassitude giving her an air of tired vacuity and the smile he gave her might have been the smile he would have given to a credulous child we are all moths coz when the candles are lit which is a riddle that you need not be bothered with her going relieved the two worldlings from an uncongenial feeling of oppression and yet some uneasiness of spirit remained to trouble both miss barbara had chilled the room for them with her wraith-like and sinister sickliness the sleek self-content of the well-fed animal had been disturbed by impressions and by thoughts that neither cared to analyse my lord of gore stood at the window stroking his periwig with some such dissatisfaction on his face as he might have betrayed at the first hint that he was growing old the girl looks ill madam made a moue oh that is nothing she is always the colour of sour cream lord but i think i hate the child she drags things into my mind that make me miserable the angles of the man's mouth twitched slightly by the plague nan why let yourself be overshadowed why indeed we might understand that you and i he turned to her sharply with a gleam of impatience in his eyes why not be rid of the little blight yes no doubt and how are you ingenious enough to suggest a method get her married lord and who would have her she is something of a bargain in movables there are plenty of debtors and fools the persuading would lie elsewhere the girl has a sort of sullen stubbornness that is worse than temper stephen gore shook his periwig with the action of an impatient horse shaking its mane i suppose these mopes were put on with her mourning the girl wants the merry devil in her rousing jove nan but she's your child there must be blood somewhere anne purcell picked up a fan spread it with an impatient whisk of the hand and glanced uneasily at the closed door she started up brusquely crossed the room flung the door open suddenly and looked down the long gallery as though to prove that they were not being spied upon then she returned to her tapestried chair well have you any plan my lord licked his upper lip 
a sly smile spreading over his healthy face. "'Will she go out with you? "'Sometimes, to the old dull houses where they wear starched aprons "'and have the servants in to prayers. "'And judge of godliness by the length of the jowl, poor people. "'No, that is not the elixir, the juice of crab-apples. "'Take her to the Mancini, that witch who turns dross into sunshine. "'The woman would wake the merry devil in a Quaker. "'She has old Rowley kissing her very slippers. "'Hortense? Who else, Nan? It is life blood mischief that the girl needs my lady's eyes flashed up at him mistrustfully for the moment he caught the look and the significance thereof and laughed oh she is not my fortune nan i am too old a moth for that candle the woman is like a conduit of red wine let loose in the garden of white hall she makes all but the abstemious drunk and the marvel is that she is just as magical with women is hortense ask my lord sussex how he likes the transfiguration of his wife castlemaine's stupid brat little way face all turned into dimples roguery and mischief she twinkles round the mancini like like a little mercury with feathers at her heels i will speak with hortense she has some sort of sisterly good will to me and a kind of pride in making sulky people merry she'll set the girl's blood spinning or i'm a fool Anne Purcell leaned back in her chair as though tired. Anything to get rid of that sour face. But it's her mawkishness, her squeamy, pray with me or I shall die, look, that makes me doubtful. The gentleman nodded understandingly. Leave that to Hortense. The Italian has a veneer of softness. She is not like a Nell Gwynne. It is a question of subtleties. Nell would swear the girl into a fit in three minutes. The Mancini has a trick of seeming a saint, when necessary. If the Italian makes no romp out of her, then I will dub her nothing but a petticoated hamlet. My lady stretched her arms with a gesture of impatient ennui. Well, we can try. Let us forget the ghost to-night. I feel I must laugh, or I shall have wrinkles round my mouth. Nell shall do that for you. You will come in my coach. And the proprieties? He laughed with the true sardonic gaiety of the restoration. Sister Kate shall see to them. Though she is stone deaf, she likes to see the dresses and the candles. There is one mistake that Mr. Milton made in that he did not tell us that the devil is deaf in one ear. End of chapter 2「Had Lady Purcell, herself unseen, followed her daughter to her room, she would have been astonished by the sudden transformation that swept over her so soon as the door closed. The apathetic figure straightened into keen aliveness. The look of vacuity vanished from her face. It was like a sudden transition from damp, listless November to the starlit brilliance of a frosty night dust and ashes at two and twenty my lord gore's echoing of biblical pessimism seemed to have lost its appropriateness so far as barbara purcell was concerned there was nothing listless about the intense and rather swarthy face that looked down into the garden with its white pillared music-room and its october memories it was more the face of some impassioned child of destiny striving to gaze into the mystery of the coming years the acting of a part to delude the world and to make men ignore her as a spiritless girl the merciless fanaticism of youth watching and ever watching behind all that assumption of listlessness and sloth then in those solitary interludes when she had no part to play the restrained passion in her breaking like lava to the surface filling her eyes with a species of prophetic fire in a little carved cabinet of black oak she kept some of those relics that had made for her a ritual of revenge her father's shirt stained with blood some of the dead flowers she had found beside him on the floor a piece of the cloth that had covered him that autumn morning almost nightly she would take these things from their hiding place spread them upon her bed and kneel before them as a papist might kneel before a relic or the symbol of the sacred heart 
as for the curb of gold with its knot of pearls she carried it always in her bosom sewn up in a case of scarlet silk distrusting every one hardly sane in the personal passion of her purpose she never parted with the talisman but treasured its possible magic for herself yet what had she discovered all these many months the knowledge that her mother had put aside her black stuffs gladly a growing sense of antipathy toward the man who had been her father's friend she could remember the time when my lord stephen had carried her through the garden on his shoulder bought her sweetmeats green stockings and jessamy gloves and even served as her valentine with a big man's playful gallantry toward a child she had thought him a splendid person then but now all had changed for her and the analysis of her own instinctive repulsion left her obstinately baffled she had no mandate from the past for hating him on the contrary facts might have stood to prove that she was his debtor she remembered how she had caught him praying beside her father's coffin and how he had risen up with a strange spasm of the face and blundered from the room he had offered money for the discovery of the truth importuned magistrates petitioned the king put his own servants in black no man could have done more loyally as a friend yet nothing had been discovered some unknown sword had passed through lionel purcell's body the very motive remained concealed the world had buried him gossiped a while and then forgotten but barbara had a heart that did not know how to forget she had southern blood the passionate heirloom of an elizabethan wooing the spanish wine of her ancestry had given her a flash of fanaticism and the swarthy melancholy of her comely face and the whole promise of her youth had bent itself like some dark-eyed zealot to a purpose that had none of the softer and more sensuous moods of life in view why should she hate this big bland stately mortal this stephen gore who had no enemies and many friends that was a question she often asked herself was it because she had been caught by the suspicion that he might console the widow for the husband's death there was no palpable sin in the possibility and yet it angered her even though she had no great love for her mother a supersensitive delicacy made her jealous for the dead the very buxom effulgence of my lord's vitality seemed to insult the shadow that haunted the house for her as she sat at the window looking down upon the garden the sun sank low in the west throwing a broad radiance under the branches of the trees their round boles were bathed in light the figures that moved about the park were touched with a weird brilliance so that a red coat shone like a ruby a blue like a sapphire a silver grey like an opal iridescent in the sun there was much of the charm of one of watteau's pictures yet with a greater significance of light and shadow dusk began to fall a hand fumbled at the latch of the door and a figure in black entered bearing a tray it was mrs jael her mother's woman a stout little body with a florid face and an over-polite way with her that repelled cynics she had amiable blue eyes that seemed to see nothing a loose mouth and a big bosom her personality appeared to have soaked itself in sentimentality as a stewed apple soaks itself in syrup barbara did not turn her head why dear heart all in the dusk here's a little dish or two set them down on the table you'll get your death chill there sitting at the window the woman fidgeted officiously about the room as though trying to insinuate her sympathy betwixt the girl's silence and reserve her dilatory habit only roused barbara's impatience mrs jael's sly succulent motherliness had lost its power of deceiving so far as anne purcell's daughter was concerned light the candles she remained motionless while the woman bustled to and fro. Thanks. You can leave me, Jael. The tire woman could meet a snub with the most obtuse good humour. Should you be tired, Mistress Barbara, I can come and put you to bed, my dear, while my lady is at the playhouse. I am old enough to put myself to bed, am I not? Mrs. Jael laughed as though bearing with a peevish miss of twelve. Dear life, of course you are. 
and she broke into a fat giggle as though something had piqued her sense of humour. Barbara's face remained turned toward the window. "'You can go, Jael.' The woman curtsied and obeyed. Her face lost its good humour, however, as quickly as a buffoon's loses its stage grin when he has turned his back upon the audience. She stood outside the door a moment, listening, and then went softly down the passage to my lady's room, with its stamped leather hangings in green and gold, its great carved bed and eastern rugs. Anne Purcell was seated before her mirror, her long brown hair, of which she was mightily proud, falling about her almost to the ground. She had a stick of charcoal in her hand and was leaning forward over the dressing-table, crowded with trinkets, scent-flasks, and pomade-boxes, staring at her face in the glass as she heightened the expressiveness of her eyes. Her glance merely shifted from the reflection of her own face to that of Mrs. Jael's figure as she entered the room. They were not a little alike, these two women, save that the one boasted more grace and polish, the other more pliability and unctuousness, and perhaps more cunning. "'Get me my red velvet gown from the cupboard, Jael.' "'Yes, my lady. Have you seen the girl?' Mrs. Jael's head and shoulders had disappeared into the depths of the carved oak wardrobe. Her voice came muffled as from a cave. "'Yes, my lady. What was she doing with herself?' "'Sitting at her window, poor dear, and looking very low and sulky.' Anne Purcell turned her head to and fro as she scrutinised herself critically in the glass. She still looked young, with her high colour and her sleek skin, her large eyes and full red mouth. Her style of comeliness seemed suited to the times, plump and pleasurable, full and free in outline and expression. My Lord of Gore had no reason to feel displeased at the prospect of possessing such a widow. "'What do you make of the girl, Joe? The tire-woman had turned from the wardrobe, with the gown of red velvet over her arm. "'The child is strange, my lady, and out of health. You might say that she has been moonstruck, or that she was watching for a ghost.' Anne Purcell moved restlessly in her chair. "'Sometimes, Jael, I think that Barbara is a little mad. "'I am ready for you to dress my hair.' "'Mrs. Jael spread the gown upon the bed. "'She doesn't seem to have a spark of life in her, poor dear. "'I'm half scared often that she should do herself some harm.' "'My lady was watching the woman's face in the mirror. "'Oh! "'She's always moping by herself like a sick bird. "'It often makes me wonder, my lady.' "'Well?' "'What Mistress Barbara does all those hours when she is alone? "'I have tried looking. "'Through the keyhole, Jael? "'Your pardon, but it is my concern for the child. "'I've started awake at night, thinking I heard her cry out, "'and I have dreamed of seeing her in her shroud.' "'A flash of cynicism swept across Anne Purcell's face, "'but she did not rebuke the woman for her sentimental canting. "'The girl ought to be watched. "'Yes, my lady.' She will not have Betty to sleep with her. A sly, suggestive smile on the face above hers in the mirror warned her that Mrs. Jael understood her in every detail. "'What were you going to say, Jael? There is no need for us to beat about the bush.' "'There is the little closet, my lady.' "'Yes, next to Mistress Barbara's room. It used to have a door leading to the bedroom.' "'But Sir Lionel, poor gentleman, had it filled in. "'Yes, I remember. "'Only with double panelling, my lady, and the woodwork has shrunk a little. "'I happened to notice it last night when I went in there, in the dark, to get a blanket, "'and Mistress Barbara's candle was burning.' "'The eyes of the two women met in the looking-glass. "'Mrs. Jael's face gave forth a sunny, insinuating smile.' "'It is not my nature, my lady, to spy and shuffle, but... "'If you scraped a little of the wood away with a knife... "'I don't feel happy about Mistress Barbara, my lady, and if... "'Be careful, Jael, you are pulling my hair. "'A hundred pardons, my lady. "'If you should see anything strange, it is well that I should know.'" End of chapter 3
by Warwick Deeping. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. If the divine Hortense ruled His Majesty the King that year, her sway spread itself over the majority of those ambitious gentlemen who were in quest of place and plunder. When women exploited the state and burst the bubble of a reputation with a kiss, politicians baited their interest with some new beauty and pinned their petitions to the flounce of a petticoat. Castlemaine had faded into France, Portsmouth watched from behind a cloud, even the irrepressible Nell had prophesied the splendour of the Mancini's conquest. Hortense had landed at Torbay, and, like the exquisite romanticist that she was, had ridden up to London in man's attire with seven servants, a maid, and a black boy in attendance. What was of more significance, she had ridden at a canter into the august heart of Whitehall. The Palace of St. James had held her for a season, till the Duke of York, with commendable brotherly discretion, had purchased Lord Windsor's house for her in the park, that such a brilliant might shine upon them from a fitting setting. There was a fascination in the fact that Cardinal Mazarin should have possessed such a sheaf of adventurous nieces. They were all beautiful, all romantically rebellious, all deliciously feminine. It was impossible not to fall in love with them, and often impossible not to forget the intoxication, for none of the cardinal's kinswomen were mere sentimental fools. As for Hortense, she was a woman for whom a man might gamble away his soul, simply because she looked at him with those black, roguish, yet shrewd eyes of hers, and made him feel that she was a desire beyond his reach. The incarnation of all womanly mystery, her beauty seemed to have stolen some singular inspiration from twenty different types. A Greek symmetry softened by a sensuous suppleness, the look of the gazelle, and yet of the falcon, the stateliness of the great lady torn aside on occasions by the nude audacity of a laughing Bacchic girl. Her sumptuousness made a man's glance drop instinctively to her bosom, and watch the drawing of her breath. There was sheer magic about her, fire in the blood colour in the mind when she entered a room the men looked at her simply because they could not help but look as my lord gore has said there was a merry heavenly devil in hortense she loved youth and all the glamour of its irresponsible vitality and would rather have seen some buffooning trick played upon a bishop than have listened to the most eloquent of sermons for she herself was vital magnetic filled with all genius of sex a mere glance at her enriched the consciousness with visions, the flush of sunsets, the heart of a rose, the redness of wine, the white curve of a woman's throat, moonlight and music, bridal casements opening upon foam. My lord of Gore heard the laughter in the great salon, even while the Mancini's footman in red and gold was taking his cane and hat. There was nothing autumnal in Hortense's house old men left their gout and their growls behind them on the staircase for the exquisite art of fooling was a thing to be cherished and enjoyed the great salon had the brilliancy of colour of a rose garden in june the brown floor reflected everything like a pool of woodland water that turns noonday into something vague and mystical it caught the gleam of a satin slipper and threw it back with the imitative rendering of the gliding body of a fish like the villas of pompeii with its painted walls and ceilings this salon enclosed sunny worldliness and picturesque realities its inmates were all sufficiently happy to be able to forget to analyse the nature of their sensations ready ready all go my lord paused in the doorway to watch an improvised chariot race that offered any gentleman the chance of laying a wager. Three gallants had been harnessed with sashes to as many chairs, and in each chair sat a lady, twice up and down the polished floor with a turn at each end, and a forfeit for upsetting. It was much like a Christmas romping party for children. A youth in blue satin with a fair-haired girl driving him came in an easy first the other two chariots had collided at the last turn with some slight damage to the furniture 
and to the delight of the spectators she who had driven the blue boy to victory frisked out joyfully and performed a passeur in the middle of the room bravo bravo hortense i have won my necklace thanks madam to tearing tom one of the fallen gallants stood rubbing a bruised chin he was a slim little fop with a weak face that pretended toward impudence and a name even sir marmaduke thibthorpe that suited his personality i protest we were overweighted the lady whom he had overturned retorted with an unequivocal sir my lord gore with the genius of an opportunist introduced his wit as a fitting climax the gibe may seem overstrained he said flicking a lace ruffle but surely the gentleman who claims to have been overweighted is hopelessly undercarved nor was the joke visible till my lord pointed whimsically to thibthorpe's very ascetic shanks whereat they all laughed more for the love of ridicule than out of courtesy to my lord's wit hortense herself sat at one of the windows watching the youngsters at their romps with the air of a laughing philosopher whose mature age of nine and twenty constituted her a fitting confidante either for children or for cynics she was dressed in some brown stuff that shone with a reddish iridescence the dress was cut low at the throat so low as to show the white breadth of her bosom a chain of pearls was woven to and fro amid the black masses of her hair my lord gore crossed the room to her and kissed her hand they were very good friends were my lord and hortense something more tangible than sentimental tendencies had drawn them together their worldly ambitions were identical the petticoat and the periwig were allied in their campaign against the amiable idiosyncrasies of the king pardon me but what a public-spirited woman i always find in you he stood beside her chair looking down at her and at the lace that filled her bosom and you my friend i come to enjoy perpetual rejuvenescence and to learn to live in the sun rather than in a fog of philosophy that gives us little but cold feet and swollen heads she looked up at him and laughed and hortense's laugh had a delightful audacity that rallied the world upon its dullness they enjoy themselves these children they romp chatter make a noise i never allow them to quarrel i try to teach them that there is one folly to be condemned the folly of suffering ourselves to lose our youth my lord's eyes were fixed on the young spark tom temple who was burlesquing a spanish dance in the middle of the salon we are always in danger of losing the art of make-believe you english are so serious so grim say rather selfish is it not often the same thing assuredly the world is only a great puppet show one of your playwright has said as much we can all see the fun even though we remain in the crowd but you english you set your teeth you push and fight you must be in the front or nothing will content you you make yourself sullen in struggling for your pleasures while every one else is laughing perhaps at you my lord bowed i think you wrong the one enlightened spot in the kingdom madam whitehall we must petition his majesty to order sir christopher to build you an academy where we can institute you a new hypatia but i gather that your philosophy would not end in oyster shells for the rest i have a favour to ask i am listening suffer me to introduce a very dull virgin into your atmosphere i want to convert her she has a conscience hortense's eyes met his frankly so have i my friend i do not question it but the child i speak of has not learned to laugh deplorable she's a tax in sulkiness upon her mother the poor woman is weary of living with a corpse in my humanity i remembered you bring her to me we shall be your debtors at least i will tell you whether she will ever laugh what mischief have we brewing now tom temple had bethought himself of some fresh piece of boyish buffoonery in which the girl whom he had drawn to victory in the chariot race had joined him it was nothing more complex than a game of double blind man's buff 
the furniture was pushed aside into corners and the salon prepared for a lively chase hortense hortense come and play it was little anne of sussex castlemaine's child whisking a scarf in one hand while she held her skirts up with the other tom temple and i are to be blind first i am to catch the men he the ladies lord gore made her a grand obeisance i will stand wilfully in the middle of the room madam and be caught then you will have to give me three pairs of gloves but you are too large my lord we should always be catching you like a leviathan in a fish pond eh or an elephant in a parlour blind my eyes up hortense and please pin up my skirts the mancini humoured her are you ready tom at your command said the youth whom a friend had blindfolded turn me hortense one two three now have at all of you if i catch you tom cry carrots my lord and hortense stepped back toward the window to watch the fun it's just like the marriage market said she catch what you can he retorted and find out what sort of thing it is afterward there was a great deal of scampering and laughing of creeping into corners and huddling against walls in the very glory of a stampede when tom temple had sailed straight with his arms spread for a bunch of girls the salon door opened and a servant announced my lord sussex the dramatic humour of the moment was missed by all save hortense and lord gore so briskly and indiscriminately went the chase my lord pursed up his lips and whistled with a significant lifting of the eyebrows hortense stifled a laugh thomas leonard lord dacre earl of sussex was a prim aristocrat with very stately prejudices against fashionable horseplay moreover he had one of those jealous and egotistical temperaments that persuades a man to believe that the woman whom he had honoured with marriage should henceforth sit meekly at his feet and play the mirror to his majesty he stood on the threshold watching the whirligig of youth with the cold wrath of a man who had come with the full expectation of being offended and to add to the irony of the moment my lady anne came doubling down the room in close pursuit of a couple of men she made her capture not three yards from her husband's person and made it gamely with both arms round the neck of sir marmaduke thibthorpe of the thin shanks she whipped off her bandage with a breathless laugh gemini but it's duke thibthorpe the gallant whose back was towards the door offered a mouth and caught his captor by the wrists forfeit forfeit a pledge sudden silence had fallen on the room to be followed by indiscriminate and half smothered giggling my lady dacre's face betrayed blank consternation let me go not for let me go fool he of the thin shanks imagined that he was amusing the salon with his waggery till a hand fastened upon his collar tom temple still blissfully blind came careering along one wall and added emphasis to the climax by coming down with a crash over a three-legged stool i shall deem it a courtesy sir if you will release lady dacre's wrists thomas leonard's face had the cold fury of a blizzard yet he was utterly polite the gallant whom he had taken by the collar had twisted round and was staring with ludicrous vacuity into my lord's eyes stephen gore watched the drama with an expression of angelic satisfaction hortense my friend let me see you stop a quarrel she had moved forward from the window with all the atmosphere of the sun king's court pardon me my lord your hand should be at my throat if you are offended the husband still had firm hold of marmaduke thibthorpe and was looking at him as though undecided whether it would be dignified to drop the fop down the stairs the aristocratic apathy in him triumphed he swept the youth aside and with a curt bow to his wife offered her his arm come madam i wish you a boisterous evening his young wife had hesitated with a whimsical grimace in the direction of hortense oh what a sermon the italian's eyes met those of lord dacre it was as though they challenged each other in their influence over the child if my lord dacre will stay with us i myself will put on the scarf and perhaps my lord gore here the leviathan bowed 
I will flounder most biblically. The Lady Anne giggled, and then glanced furtively at her husband's face. A thousand thanks. My Lord Gore should delight even the psalmist. But my coach is waiting. I wish you no broken furniture. Anne, come. There was a short pregnant silence when he had departed with his child-wife on his arm. Stephen Gore shrugged his shoulders and smiled at Hortense. Most serious of swains, old sage Solomon, who would grudge him the responsibility of taming even one wife? Alas, another unfortunate who has not learned to laugh. Sir Marmaduke Thibthorpe was standing sheepishly beside the door, striving to look amused. Such is fate, he giggled, and such is a stool, quoth Thomas Temple, sticking out a leg with a blotch of blood on his stocking. My Lord Gore took leave of Hortense after talking with her a moment alone by the window. "'Bring her to me, my friend,' she said, as he made his bow. "'If you cannot cure her, ah, well, we shall see.' He was crossing the park when a servant met him and handed him a note. It was sealed with pink wax and smelled of ambergris. My Lord opened it as he strolled under the trees. "'I would see you soon. Jail has been of use to me.' A. P. End of chapter 4. Chapter 5 A ship's boat came up the river, with half a dozen brown fellows tugging at the oars their dark skins and the patched picturesqueness of their gaudy-coloured shirts giving them something of the air of a boatload of buccaneers with gaily kerchiefed heads ringed ears and belts full of pistols a man in a soiled red coat with remnants of lace hanging to the cuffs sat in the stern sheets his sword across his knees and beside him on the gunwale squatted a boy whose cheeky sparrow's face stared out from a tangle of crisp fair hair the man in the red coat looked even more brown and picturesque than the seaman at the oars he wore no wig under his battered beaver and his own black hair looked as though it had not been barbered for six months his shoes had lost their buckles and the stocking of his right leg showed a hole the size of a guinea above the heel three more strokes and easy lads right captain let her run now in with the bow sweeps they had passed the savoy and drawn close in toward charing steps with a west wind sending the water slapping against the planking the man in the red coat held the tiller and let the boat glide in while the seamen shipped their oars the boat's nose rubbed against the stone facing of the steps while a brown hand or two grabbed at the mooring rings the boy on the gunwale was the first to leap ashore a number of watermen lounging about the steps were staring at the boat and its crew and exchanging opinions thereon with more candour than courtesy the sea captain standing in the stern sheets buckled his sword to a faded baldric callous to any criticism that might be lavished on him by the riverside sots good luck to you captain you won't forget us sir we'll follow you round cape horn again for a fight the man in the red coat looked down at the brown faces along the boat that were turned to him with a species of watchful dog-like alertness i shall have my flag flying in a month he said men shan't rot down at deptford the devil knows that we have our tallies to count in the south, eh? And Jasper shall have a long coronado, coronado to squint along. Good luck to you, lads. Here's the end of the stocking. I wish it were deeper. He tossed a purse to a grizzled old giant who was leaning upon his oar. The man picked it up, looked at it lovingly a moment, and then glanced over his shoulder at the men behind him. No dirty dog's tricks here, growled one. "'There's a gold piece or two for ye,' said another, slapping his belt. The giant stretched out a great fist with the purse in it. "'Maybe you'll be selling the little frigate, Captain. We can knock along—' The man in the red coat looked him straight in the eyes. "'Damnation, Jasper, I owe you all your pay. 
yet pocket it for beer money drink your last guinea captain not me why man i can get a bagful for the asking in an hour and look you all stand by down at the eight bells to-morrow i'll pay every man of you before noon the watermen above have been listening to this dialogue with ribald cynicism holy moses said one here's a boatload of saints throw it up here mate we ain't shy of the dross the captain had climbed the steps with the boy beside him but old jasper standing up in the boat with his oar held like a pike turned his sea eagle's face toward the gentry on the causeway squeak ye land rats by god's death you've never seen the inside of a barbary prison if you were men you'd take your hat off to the captain but being land gaffer you're all mud muck and tallow shove her off mates or i'll be smashing some chicken stilts with me oar the loungers jeered him valiantly as the bow sweeps churned foam and the boat gathering way swung out into the river look at their great mouths said the sea wolf grimly when we want our bilge emptying we'll send for em to have a drink meanwhile the man in the red coat and the boy had passed up the passage from the river in the direction of charing cross the shabbiness of their raiment flattering the curiosity of the passers-by the man in the red coat appeared wholly at his ease as for the boy he was ready to spread his fingers at the whole town on the very first provocation even the fact that he had a rent in his breeches that suffered a certain portion of his underlinen to protrude did not humble his self-satisfaction the sea captain who had been walking with his chin in the air glanced down suddenly at the boy beside him how are the stores sparking my lad getting low in the hold sir we'll put in and replenish the boy gave a greedy twinkle hello i thought i told jasper to patch you up with a piece of sailcloth sparkin did not betray any self-conscious cowardice he was worse off captain poor devil and the man in the red coat laughed they turned into the three tons at charing cross the sea captain looking more like a white friars bully than a gentleman adventurer two comfortable citizens gathered up the skirts of their coats and edged away sourly when the newcomers sat down next them at a table the captain remarked their neighbourly caution and smiled good day gentlemen we embarrass you perhaps there was a humorous grimness about his mouth that carried conviction not at all sir not at all said the larger of the twain poised between propitiation and distrust we are not scotch sir so you will catch nothing we are not scotch sir so you will catch nothing they dined in silence the boy's animation divided between his plate and his surroundings while the man in the red coat watched him with the air of one who has an abundant past to feed his thoughts his neighbours cast curious momentary glances at him from time to time but having once spoken he appeared to have forgotten their existence they had but to look beneath the superficial shabbiness to see that the man was of some standing in the world he had that gift of remaining statuesquely silent that poise that suggests power the brown resolute face had the comeliness of courage if no great stature his sturdy hollow-backed figure betrayed strength to those who could distinguish between fat and muscle the boy's appetite reached impotence at last the man in the red coat beckoned to the servant paid his due with odd small change routed out of every pocket and with a curt bow to his neighbours walked out into the street he made his way towards st james's and paused in the street of that same name before a big house with a pompous portico a flight of steps led up to the great door run up and knock the boy obeyed his breeches bringing a smile to the sea captain's face as he waited unconcernedly on the sidewalk don't mind your knuckles my lad and sparking hammered as though he were sounding the ship's bell a servant in livery opened the door and looked down at the boy with the air of a bully scenting a beggar the man in the red coat listened to the following dialogue my lord gore's house this what do you want at the front door lord gore's house oh is it well is it stupid 
here you skip it you the sea captain interposed with a laugh curving his mouth there was so much significance in the fellow's gospel of cloth wake up tom richards the footman's eyes protruded he stared down at the seaman with the air of a superior being resenting and distrusting familiarity well what do you want and his glance added you shabby cutthroat looking devil the man in red ascended the steps while the servant's face receded inch by inch so that he resembled a discreet dog backing sulkily into his kennel he was about to clap the door to when the captain pushed sparkin bodily into the breach richards man have you forgotten me sparkin's head had taken the fellow well in the stomach and the shock may have accounted for the man's vacant and astonished face is my lord in brisk up man and don't judge the whole world by its coat the lord forgive me sir possibly he will richards i didn't know you mr john sir you're so brown and shabby richards say it and have done is my lord in town oh yes sir won't you come in and dine there is a good joint of roast mr john sir and a barrel of oysters my lord is at lady purcell's in pall mall lady anne purcell's yes mr john he turned and walked down the steps the footman marvelling at his effrontery in wearing such dastardly clothes take the boy in richards richards and master sparkin regarded each other suspiciously give him a wash and a new pair of breeches if you can find a pair to fit yes mr john and your baggage sir lies somewhere in barbary richards so you'll need not trouble your head about that the whole episode so piqued the footman that he proceeded to lead the boy in the direction of the kitchen quarters by the ear whereat sparkin who had already gauged the gentleman's tonnage fetched him a valiant kick upon the shin and broke loose with a grin of whole-hearted scorn you keep your hands to yourself tom richards the footman made a grab at the boy but sparking was on the alert touch me and i'll dig my dirk into you mr richards reverted to that easier and safer weapon the tongue didn't mr john tell me to wash you you little bundle of rags sparkin's hand went to his belt you touch me and i'll let your blood for you tom richards the lord forgive me sir and he imitated the man's voice you'd be learning something if you went to sea with captain gore oh i should should i the devil you would and you'd be teaching me perhaps said the man in livery with a sententious sniff twouldn't be my business they'd send you to the cook's galley to clean pots while sparking was instilling obfuscated respect and caution into tom richards captain john gore made his way to lady purcell's house the stare he met there was no more flattering than that which his father's servant had given him a three days beard no wig a soiled coat and a moulting beaver were not calculated to conciliate menials my lord gore here is he what may your business be he walked in over the servant's toes tell my lord that captain gore is below captain gore sir the gentleman merely reiterated the order with a straight stare would you be pleased sir to walk into the garden john gore followed the fellow's lead amused at the caution that did not intend to offer him the chance of pocketing anything of value in the house he was left pacing the gravel walks with his red coat showing up against the green of the grass john gore had taken two turns up and down the garden when a girl came out between the pillars of the music-room and stood gazing at the gentleman's broad back with the impatient air of one who has been cornered by a stranger she drew back again as though waiting her opportunity to cross from the portico to the house without being observed her chance came and she seized it only to discover that the garden door of the house was locked the man in the red coat turned and came down the path again he caught sight of the girl standing on the steps bowed and lifted his hat to her i am afraid you are locked out he said oh your man did not like the look of me i suppose and wisely turned the key in the lock there seems nothing to be pocketed in the garden but a few green peaches 
they were looking straight into each other's eyes who this sturdy shabby gentleman could be barbara could not gather for the moment nor was she pleased at being left there at his mercy you have forgotten me mistress barbara he said she frowned slightly my father lord gore is here i believe her eyes flashed suddenly and she coloured oh you are the boy who pulled your ribbons off that day at sheen you may remember the incident and he bowed barbara remembered it there was a short pause you have changed she said curtly glancing over her shoulder at the glass panel in the door he passed a hand critically over his chin seemingly in the heat of adventure my father's man took me for a bully i have been in england about five hours they stood regarding each other in silence the man puzzled by her swarthy sullen face the girl conscious of a rush of embittered memories it was as though something out of the past had risen up before her something ignorant and unwelcome that might blunder any moment against her sensitive reserve i trust that sir lionel is hearty as ever she seized the handle of the door and shook it i wonder where that fool miles pardon me shall i shout barbara kept one shoulder turned toward him her face bleak and white reflected in the glass panel of the door oh at last there was the sound of a key turning in a lock she pushed past the man as he opened the door leaving john gore wondering what manner of mischief three years had made in a girl's temper in the parlour with its panelling its massive furniture and great fireplace filled with blue dutch tiles anne purcell and my lord gore had been talking for above an hour my lord was standing at a window in his favourite attitude of philosophic stateliness the lady's face had an impatient sharpness of expression that hinted that the man's sympathy had not sounded the deeps of her unrest i tell you nan that these these possibilities leave us where we stood before the girl may be a little touched in the head leave her to hortense if she cannot tame her well there are other ways anne seemed less credulous and more obstinate than he desired i am not superstitious but to think of the girl praying to those i tell you stephen the thought of it makes me afraid thank heaven she is praying in the dark tush tush and he smiled down at her the girl is not quite human we understand her you and i yet you seem to lack that diplomatic foresight nan that sees in an enemy's tricks the very tools for one's own hand she looked up at him blankly no i foresee nothing save that betrayal which if it occurred could be turned aside as easily as i snap my fingers there is but one person to be considered and we must keep her fat and contented jail yes the woman is greedy that simplifies everything to-morrow then you will come with me to the mancini's oh if it will help at least it can do no harm listen they heard the footsteps of the servant climbing the stairs and in ten seconds my lord gore had the first news of his seafaring and unshaven son End of chapter five chapter six of mad barbara by warwick deeping this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six my lord gore could not conceal an instinct of fastidious disapproval as he walked homeward with his son along pall mall sumptuousness came before godliness in his scheme of values and though poverty and slovenliness were inevitable to the world my lord found them useful as a respectable background to heighten the effects of an exquisite refinement in dress but to have a soiled and weather-beaten scamp familiarly at one's elbow offered too crude a contrast and suggested a sinister interest in whitefriars what a devil of a mess you are in jack my man and there was a slight lifting of my lord's nostrils you might have sent one of the men to me instead of making a martyr of yourself the reference to martyrdom carried a perfect sincerity for it would have pained stephen gore inexpressibly to have been caught in a seedy coat 
john gore met his father's critical sidelong glance it is only in plays and poems sir that you find your adventurer clean and splendid we were muzzle to muzzle with those heathen for half a day the prison they put us in was monstrously dirty and the vegetation they plant in their gardens and about their fields seem to have been created with a grudge against people who have to run we ran sir like heroes despite aloes cacti and thorns like a regiment of foot with sloped pikes after such incidents one has a tendency toward torn clothes my lord nodded still jack said he when you fall in a ditch and get muddied to the chin you do not stroll home through the park at three in the afternoon you should read don quixote sir a great book that i am more of a philosopher than the spaniard his father did not trouble to suppress a sarcastic smile oh if you are a philosopher i have nothing more to say save that you have chosen the wrong school there is the philosophy of clothes to be considered at this happy period of ours if you wish to try your diogenes's humour go to court in some such scraffle you would be clapped in the tower for insulting the king john gore laughed who himself knows what ragged stockings and flea-ridden beds mean exactly so sir and therefore any tactless allusion to the past would be uncourtier like in the extreme my lord betrayed some impatience in the last retort very possibly because he beheld a group of acquaintances approaching with all the niceness of fashionable distinction the young gallants of the court had all the merciless cynicism of premature middle age genius to prove itself scintillated with satire even when the youngsters laughed their laughter symbolized an epigram a caricature or a lampoon lord gore advanced very valiantly under the enemy's fire the party numbered among its members ton chiffinch a redoubtable royal pimp there was an ironical lifting of hats john gore's costume had interested the party for the last twenty yards of its approach my lord would have marched past with flags flying but from some instinct of devilry the gentleman appeared overjoyed at the rencontre we must take you with us to the mall my lord his majesty has a match there bring your friend with you sir by the by who is he and chiffinch took stephen gore familiarly by the button and dropped his voice to a forced whisper my lord's dignity did not falter he had caught a peculiar look in his son's eyes that pricked the pride in him gentlemen captain john gore my son they bowed all of them with sarcastic deference delighted sir you have seen hard service sir no doubt you are a great traveller may i ask your honour whether it is true that the spaniards in peru grow their beards down to their belts the man in the red coat showed no trace of temper i lost my laces and my ribbons on the coast of africa gentlemen he said they are a slovenly crew those barbary corsairs it is a pleasure to find myself once more among men my lord stood regarding the upper windows of a house with stately unconcern he glanced sharply at his son and then bowed to chiffinch and his party come jack simpson of the exchange must have been waiting an hour for you my son is like king john gentlemen he has lost bag and baggage to the sea they parted with ironical smiles my lord spreading himself like an indian in full sail who the devil may simpson be asked the son bluntly his father frowned my recommendation sir and in a lower voice the first tailor in the kingdom you booby the one reputation that might carry shot into those gentlemen's hulls such is the world sir that you can be put in countenance by uttering the name of your tailor concerning his adventures john gore spoke with the grim reserve of a man who had learned that the least impressive thing in this world is to boast he had lost his ship and seen the walls of an african prison an ironical climax to a seventeenth-century odyssey more from incidental allusions than from any coherent confession his father learned that he had touched even japan and far cathay his knight errantry of the sea carrying him into more than one valiant skirmish an unhappy whim had lured him when homeward bound 
into the blue sea of the Phoenicians and the Greeks, there to be pounced upon by a squadron of African rovers. They had carried his decks by boarding after a five hours' fight. My lord listened with an air of fatherly condescension before reverting to the eternal topic of clothes. "'I must turn you loose in my wardrobe, Jack, my man. You can contrive a makeshift for a week or two. We must have Simpson in for you tomorrow.' His manner was semi-jocular and genial, as though this man of many oceans was still a boy poling a punt on an ancestral fish-pond. My lord had never travelled save into France and Holland, and the wild byways of the world had no significance for him. As a courtier and an aristocrat he was a complete and perfect figure, and the life of a gentleman about court had given him the grandiose attitude of one who had turned the last page of worldly philosophy. He had said what he pleased for many years to the great majority of people with whom he had come in contact. His air itself suggested the majestic finality of experience. They supped together in the house of St. James's Street, my lord asking questions in a perfunctory fashion, often interrupting the replies by irrelevant digressions, and displaying the careless contempt of the egotist for those superfluous subjects of which he condescended to be ignorant. It appeared to the son that the father was preoccupied by other matters. It was only when they came to the discussion of certain questions concerning property that my lord showed some of the acumen of the master of the many tenants. "'How much have you lost by this voyage of yours? As for throwing money into the sea—' John Gore pretended to no grievance. "'It is only what other men would have spent on petticoats and horses. Call it an eccentric extravagance. I have had a glimpse of the earth to balance the loss.' about my yorkshire property i have had my hand on it jack swindale has been a success as steward more money for the seas more is that the cry john gore maintained a meditative reserve possibly i have the rent roll and a copy of the accounts in my desk go down and see swindale for yourself there is no need to think of such a means as a mortgage money has been accumulating "'Besides, my boy, though your mother left her property to you, my own purse is always open.' The son thanked him and changed to another subject, a subject that had been lurking for an hour or more in the conscious background of my lord's mind. "'How is Lionel Purcell?' Stephen Gore turned his wine-glass round and round by the stem, eyeing his own white fingers and the exquisite lace of his ruffles. "'Dead,' he said shortly. The man in the red coat drew his heels up under his chair and leaned his elbows on the table. "'Dead? Why, of all the quiet, careful livers! He had no say in the matter. Someone killed him.' There was a short pause. The elder man's face remained a stately, meditative mask. He raised the wine-glass and sipped the wine, pressing his lace cravat back with his left hand. "'It was a sad affair, Jack.' and came as a blow to me who killed him ah that is the question no one knows i suspect that no one will ever know was there a reason my lord looked at his son shrewdly meaningly a man of the world could infer these scholars well they have blood in them like other mortals we breathe nothing of it because of the girl barbara my lord nodded. The whole tragedy broke something in the child. She was bright and sparkling enough, you remember, though always a little fierce. There is the fear. He paused expressively, with his eyes on his son's face. There is the fear of madness. The thing seems to have worn on her, chafed her mind. Anne Purcell and I have done what we can, for God knows I was Lionel Purcell's friend. But there is always the chance. She's not like other women. My lord spoke as a man who feels an old burden chafe his shoulder. As for the son, he was looking beyond his father at the opposite wall. He recalled the girl as he had seen her in the garden. She had baffled him. Here was the explanation. It is well that she should never know, he said gravely. She has enough to haunt her, without that. My lord had finished his wine and fruit. 
he rose from the table and catching sight of himself in a venetian mirror on the wall turned away with a slight frown you had better amuse yourself choosing some of my clothes he said i have business tonight with pembroke and i may be late richards will give you the keys we are much of a size jack though you are shorter in the shanks thank the lord for one mercy i have not put on too much fat by the light of a couple of candles in silver sconces john gore amused himself in my lord's bedroom with the boy sparkin to act as a self-constituted judge of fashion mr richards who had accompanied them indulged in a few polite and irrelevant directions and then departed as though he found the boy's company incompatible with his own every corner of the bedroom soon had its selection of satins camlets and cloths for sparkin appeared possessed by an exuberant desire to see and handle everything my lord's wardrobe was the wardrobe of a gentleman who had a fancy for every colour and for every combination of shades his stockings were to be numbered by the dozen and sparkin half hidden in a chest bailed the stuffs out as though he were bailing water out of a boat easy there you young hound what manner of tangle do you think you are making the boy turned a hot and happy face to him take your choice captain what would some of the greenwich girls give for a picking how does crushed strawberry please you john gore was standing in front of a mirror trying on a coat that's a sweet thing captain just look at the lace here's a chest we haven't opened yet leave it alone then you have tumbled enough shirts to give tom richards work for a week sparkin had begun fumbling with the keys he found the right one as john gore spoke and lifted the chest lid as though there was no disobedience in looking what have you got there supremely tempted sparkin had fished out a periwig and clapped it on his head he pulled it off again just as briskly merely remarking that the thing tickled a second dive of the arm brought up a black cloak edged with gold cord and lined with purple silk bring that here boy sparkin obeyed and john gore swung it over his shoulders just your colour captain said the boy seriously thanks for a valuable opinion well put it aside with the shirts and stockings i have chosen the devil take you but what a fearsome mess you have made that soon mended captain and after depositing the black cloak on the bed he proceeded to fill his arms with my lord's luxuries and tumble them casually into chest and cupboard here leave the clothes alone but you had better out of regard for those new breeches of yours riches must come up and restore order a spasm of vivacious devilry lit up the boy's face so he had captain he is such a particular man shall i call down the stairs yes call away sparking disappeared and john gore heard his voice piping through the house richards tom richards there i say richards mr thomas richards the captain's orders are that you should come aloft and clear up the clothes sparking's voice reached to the nether regions for slow and unwilling footsteps were heard below the boy slipped down the stairs and met the man with a loud whisper the captain has made a most fearsome muddle tom he turned out every chest and cupboard in the room just you come and look it's like a rag booth at a fair End of chapter six chapter seven of mad barbara by warwick deeping this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. Barbara Purcell could not sleep that night, perhaps because she had chosen not to have her curtains drawn, so that the light of the full moon poured into the room. An increasing restlessness brought with it that feverish race of thoughts where the memories of years flash out and intermingle like fantastic figures at a masked ball she sat up at last in bed shook her dark hair free from her shoulders and stretched her arms out over her knees the window stood a brilliant square in the blackness of the wall each lozenge of glass like crystal set in ebony through the open casement she could see the silvery domes of the great trees in the park and the few faint clouds that streaked the summer sky her restlessness and the close night air 
made the moonlight seem like a shower of icy spray and it was as though some feverish freak inspired her with the whim of bathing her hands and face in it for she slipped out of bed her white feet gliding over the polished woodwork of the floor a sound like the scuffling of rats behind the wainscoting startled her for a moment so that she stood listening with her face turned toward the door the deep silence of the house seemed to listen with her for the recurrence of the sound but she heard nothing but the sigh of her own breath moving to the window she leaned her hands upon the sill letting the draught play upon her bosom and in her hair she felt as though the night laid a cool hand upon her forehead while the infinite calmness of everything entered into her soul beneath her lay the garden the lawn like a stretch of dusky silver the bay trees casting sharp shadows upon it the portico of the music-room cut into black panels by its pillars she stood gazing down upon it all with the air of one whose mind was full of dreams the moon mirrored itself twin images within her eyes and made her night gear shine like snow under the torrent of her hair distant clocks began chiming suddenly to be followed by the deep pealing of the hour the sound roused the girl from her lethargy like the challenge of a trumpet waking a sentinel at his post the echoes of the chimes still seemed to be sweeping upward into the moonlight when she heard a sound below her in the house it was like the snap of a turning lock brief crisp and final the striking of the hour might have had the significance of a signal to someone in the house she was still listening for other sounds to follow when a shadow moved out between the outlines of the bay trees on the lawn barbara leaned toward the window and then drew back with an instinct of caution still keeping her view of the moonlit garden the shadow and the figure that cast it moved toward the music-room with the gliding motion attributed to ghosts the breath of the night air seemed doubly cold upon her face and bosom for the moment she saw the figure disappear under the portico of the music-room with all the mystery of the night to solemnize its passing a slight shiver swept up her limbs toward her heart things may seem possible at such an hour that the reason might ridicule at noon yet she remembered the snap of the shooting lock and that mere incident of sound held the supernatural vagueness of her thoughts in thrall still listening she seemed to hear something that brought a sharp and almost fierce expression to her face holding her breath she leaned against the window jamb as though to steady herself against the slightest movement that might distract her sense of hearing a murmur of voices came to her out of the silence of the night like the rustle of aspen leaves in a light wind her body straightened suddenly bearing its weight upon one outstretched arm whose hand rested upon the jamb of the window her eyes became brighter in the moonlight her throat showed white under her raised chin then turning as though impelled by some inspired thought she moved toward the door opened it and stepped out into the gallery pausing for an instant she began to walk slowly down the passageway toward a transomed window that gleamed white in the moonlight she moved haughtily with no shrinking haste her head held high her hands hanging at her sides it was the poise of a sleepwalker, stately, wide-eyed, without a flicker of self-consciousness. Barbara had not gone ten steps before she heard a slight sound behind her like the rustle of a skirt. Startled though she may have been, she betrayed nothing, but moved on with every sense alert. That someone was close behind her she felt assured. Her hand was on the latch of her mother's door before her suspicions began to be confirmed she pushed the door open and crossed the threshold yet though the room was in utter darkness she felt instinctively that it was empty turning slowly so that she faced the door she saw the outline of a figure framed there against the dim glow of the moonlight that filled the gallery barbara stood motionless a while making no sign or sound and then walked straight toward the door the figure faltered a moment before gliding aside barbara passed it her eyes fixed as on some dreamy distance 
her face blank and expressionless, her step unhurried. As she passed back along the gallery, she felt that the figure was following her, and she knew that it was a woman, and that woman, Mrs. Jail. Still statuesque as one walking in her sleep, she re-entered her room, closed the door, locked it, and moved toward the window. She stood there a moment, motionless, and if she saw anything in the garden beneath her, she betrayed no feeling and no conscious life. Before the clocks had chimed the half-hour, she was in her bed again, but not to sleep. By the door leading into the garden, two shadowy figures were whispering together. She was asleep? Yes, my lady. Are you sure? She walked past me as though I was not there. I have seen such a thing before, yet it gave me a fright. And she went to my room, Jail? It was as dark as a cupboard, my lady. No one could have told that it was empty, even if they had been awake. The sky was a brave blue next morning, and the air full of the scent of summer, when Barbara came down to the little parlour that looked out on the garden. Her air of lethargy had a touch of gentleness to soften it. Anne Purcell was already at the table. A plate of cherries and a flask of red wine added colour to the prosaic usefulness of pie and bacon. Anne Purcell glanced at her daughter with momentary and questioning distrust. The girl's face betrayed no more self-consciousness than the great white loaf on the trencher near her mother. She sat down, glanced over the table listlessly, and then through the window where the sun was shining. "'You look tired, Barbie.' An insinuating friendliness approached in her mother's voice. "'Tired? I slept all night. How fresh the garden looks. I feel I should like a drive in the park today.' "'Yes, you want more interest, more bustle in your life.' "'Perhaps I should have fewer moods. Take some wine, dear.' and she pushed the flask toward her. Why not trust yourself to me a little more? We are not all so melancholy. I might only spoil your pleasure. Nonsense! I should enjoy life more if you had a happier face. End of chapter 7chapter 8 of Mad Barbara by Warwick Deeping this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Set a thief to catch a thief, and a woman to unravel the character of a woman. Such was the aphorism my Lord Gore had bestowed in confidence upon Hortense when he had bequeathed Anne Purcell's daughter to the Italian's cleverness. If there were anything beneath that sullen and lethargic surface, Hortense would discover it, and perhaps resurrect the girl's instinct to laugh and live. Few guests met in the painted salon that summer evening, three girls of Barbara's age, an elderly knight with sharp, humorous eyes, a sentimental widow, and Hortense. The windows were open toward the park, where dull, rain-laden clouds shut out the stars. A few shaded candles in sconces along the walls made a glimmering twilight in the room, and in one corner a little brazen lamp burned perfumed oil, so that the air was richly scented. A girl stood singing beside the harpsichord when Anne Purcell and her daughter entered the salon. Hortense herself was accompanying the song, while those who listened were like figures in a picture, each with a shadowy individuality of its own. There was an atmosphere of opulence and sensitive refinement about the scene. The breeze of youth had been banished, and the salon made sacred to musing maturity. Hortense excelled in the art of welcoming a friend. Even the flowing lines of her figure could put forth an intoxicating graciousness that fascinated women as well as men. She suggested infinite sympathy, yet infinite shrewdness. Strangers might have mistrusted her, if she had shown only the one or the other. My Lady Anne looked commonplace beside Hortense. Her smile had a crude affectation of goodwill that did not completely conceal latent distrust and jealousy. The Englishwoman was there with a purpose, and a purpose is often one of the most difficult things on earth to smother. It was in the daughter that Hortense discovered a vacant unapproachableness, a callous apathy that piqued her interest. 
the girl was not gauche despite her silence it was as though her individuality refused to mingle with the individuality of others hortense disposed of my lady by setting her to chat with the grim old gentleman in the big periwig whose interest in life gravitated between the latest piece of learned gossip he might pick up at the meetings of the royal society and the lighter more glittering gossip of whitehall my lady could at least satisfy him in the lighter vein the three girls were given a pack of cards and a table in a corner the sentimental widow some new book hortense herself drew barbara aside toward one of the windows as though she were the one person whom she chose to actively amuse the prelude between them resembled a game of chess in which one player made tentative moves to which the other blankly refused to respond a series of challenges provoked nothing but monosyllabic answers hortense had no difficulty as a rule in persuading even dull or frightened people to talk there were many mundane topics to be invoked when necessary clothes music books men amusements and other women mere de dieu she confessed to herself at last the child is impenetrable there is a magic spring in every mortal i have not touched it here as yet she studied barbara with an easy air of the woman of the world who does not betray the glance behind the eyes and who is your great friend in england cara mia we women must always have a confidential mirror though it does not always tell us the truth when i was quite young i used to write down all my thoughts and adventures in a book some of us make friends with our own souls in our diaries barbara looked at her as though all the italian subtle suggestiveness beat on nothing more intelligent than the blank surface of a wall do you keep a diary madam hortense laughed oh life is my diary and then i write on the faces of those i meet do you how you must guess my meaning i can never guess anything how dull have you travelled much with your mother my mother yes is she not charming so young and june like she should promise you a long youth i do not care whether she does or not then you have not learned to envy her what have i to envy hortense paused with a momentary gleam of impatience in her eyes has the child any enthusiasm let us try her on another surface do you remember your father cara mia barbara's eyes met the mancini's with a sudden intense stare my father he was a great scholar was he not yes books become such friends to us did he teach you at all oh sometimes he was very patient how dark the sky looks hortense smiled she had a suspicion that she was no longer fumbling in the dark she had touched the girl beneath her apathy and her reserve have you your father's books still they are in the library covered with dust why do you not keep the dust away by reading them you could fancy yourself talking with him when you turned the pages he had turned could i hortense became silent suddenly her face turned with an expression of sadness toward the night of course it is our memories that we live again the past may become a kind of religion to us she did not look at the girl but her brilliant and sensitive consciousness waited for impressions barbara remained motionless with stolid morose face what clever things you think of she said abruptly but the books are nearly all in latin i wish i had not eaten so much supper it always makes me sleepy and stupid hortense turned with a sharpness that contradicted her soft and sympathetic attitude perhaps you would like some wine no i thank you madam mother made me drink half a jugful before we came she said that it might make me talk hortense gave her one searching stare either you are very clever or very dull she said to herself i must try other methods for i want to see you show yourself then we may understand it was possible that the mancini knew that her salon would not maintain its air of platonic tranquillity throughout the whole evening 
she who queened it for the moment above the galaxy of queens could not be left long uncourted by the courtiers of her king she was a spirit of wit and the pyre of passion for that year at least a fire about which the moths might flutter a partisan of princes a shrewd roguish laughter-loving woman she was never unwilling that a fashionable rout should storm and take possession of her house for they came to entertain her with their nonsense and to flatter her pride by attending at her court a flare of links across the park and the sound of laughter warned hortense of a possible invasion the torches flowed in the direction of her house with a confusion of voices that betrayed the spirit of the invaders barbara who sat watching the stream of fire saw the link boys running on ahead with the glare of their torches flashing over the grass and upon the trunks of the trees while behind these fireflies came a stream of gentlemen in bright-coloured cloaks arguing and laughing some of them flourishing their swords like sticks hortense appealed to her guests alas my friends here come the court innocents with all manner of nonsense in their noddles shall we stand a siege you will never keep fools out of heaven madam said the fellow of the royal society with a cynical sniff have them in and let us moralize on the wasted energies of youth and you my vestals the girls at the card table betrayed no immoderate shyness and my lady purcell should a woman be afraid of a boy's tongue we can clip it with our wit they are in the courtyard already the mad children let us see what power music may have over them and she sat down at the harpsichord and began to play with great unction a dolorous chant that was familiar to serious singers of psalms Comus and his crew came in right merrily with a superfluity of ironical obeisances and vivid colour contrasts in their clothes the party was headed by a figure in the black silk gown with huge lawn ruffles at the wrists a white periwig and a big lace bib barbara recognised my lord gore among the gentlemen and in the background she caught a glimpse of the brown and imperturbable face of john gore his son hortense still fingered out her psalm as though ignoring the eruption of the world the flesh and the devil into her house the three girls at the card table sat with eyes cast down and hands folded demurely in prim laps the grim old gentleman reclined in his chair and stared at the intruders with the inimitable assurance of a diogenes barbara remained by the window in isolation while her mother and the widow were smiling and whispering together in a corner the gentry of whitehall appreciated the satirical humour of their welcome hortense was laughing at them with that dolorous canticle of hers now thomas where is your wit prick the bishop's calves he has gone to sleep they laughed and applauded as the figure in the silk gown moved forward into the room mr thomas temple could play a variety of parts his mimicry excelled in burlesquing the episcopate my children let peace be upon this house and he gave them a pompous blessing with upraised hands hortense rose from the harpsichord with the assumed fire of a fanatic children of belial lady pardon me they are already qualifying as saints what sayest thou antichrist thou red man of rome woe woe unto this city when its priests wax fat in purple and fine linen the bishop extended reproving hands woman blaspheme not we are here to save all souls with the kiss of peace my children come hither have you been baptized the three girls tittered hortense stood forward flinging out one arm with a passionate gesture of scorn behold the book of the beast behold the serpent without a surplice and you ye children of iniquity make way for thomas with the wine there was a shout of laughter as my lord the bishop picking up his skirts cut a delighted caper alas she has bewitched me since sack where art thou o strengthener of my soul a footman bearing a tray with flasks and glasses moved stolidly through the crowd the mock churchman extended a protecting arm bless you my son blessed are all vintners and tavern keepers and you madam he turned to her with a stately obeisance our lord the king of his nobleness 
hath sent us to unbind your eyes and to lead you into the paths of light we will baptize those innocents yonder into the one true church even the church of sack and sashes let all the heathen rejoice for the souls we shall save this day from the pit of prudery no woman can be saved unless she be kissed amen End of chapter 8chapter nine of mad barbara by warwick deeping this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine for a girl to maintain her dignity in some such assemblage as that at the house of hortense she needed a glib tongue an easy temper and no prejudices with regard to the inviolate sanctity of her lips or cheek the gentlemen of fashion had renounced the central superstition of chivalry while retaining some of its outward pageantry and splendour cynics and worldlings they had no real reverence for woman no belief in her honour and little consideration for her name she was merely a thing to be coveted to be maligned or to be made perhaps the butt of the bitterest and most unmanly ridicule how mean and utterly contemptible those splendid gentlemen of the court could be anne hyde had learned in the days before she became a duchess so many noble fellows conspiring to swear away a woman's honour and fabricating unclean lies about her in the belief they would please a prince barbara remained isolated by the window studying the scene with an expression of sulky scorn it was her first glimpse at the gadflies of the court their methods of attack and of torture were to her things unknown many of the men had prematurely aged features harsh skins and unhealthy eyes some two or three were palpably the worse for wine and despite their rich clothes and the beauty of mere surface refinement they brought an atmosphere of unwholesome insolence into the italian's salon an insolence that made such true aristocrats as john evelyn despair of the courts of kings the mancini had drawn the mock bishop aside and they were talking together with ironical little smiles and gestures barbara met hortense's eyes across the room the man in the silk cassock glanced also in the same direction and barbara had the sudden sense of being under discussion the majority of the men were drinking wine at a side table talking loudly and without an atom of restraint as though they were in a tavern and not in the salon of a great lady my lord gore and his son were the centre of a little group the brown face of the sea captain contrasting with the whiter skins of the idlers about town he was glancing about the room as though tired of being penned up in a corner by a party of fops with whom he had no sympathy more than once his eyes met those of barbara purcell they appeared to be the only two people in the room who chafed instinctively at their surroundings a loud voice at the door of the salon strident and harsh overtopped the babbling of the crowd heads were turned in the direction periwigs bowed slim swords cocked under the velvet coat-tails the commotion hinted at the entry of some great captain in the campaign of pleasure the knot of many coloured figures fell apart and a big man in black and silver stalked forward to salute hortense it was philip of pembroke the most outrageous and hot-headed aristocrat in the kingdom a man whose own friends treated him as they would have treated an open powder mine and whose very friendship was often the prelude to a quarrel few people had the nerve to sit near him at table for an argument was his great joy and his method of debate was so fierce and fanatical that his arguments very frequently took the form of wine-bottles and dishes or any forcible persuader that came to hand he would quarrel with any one anywhere on any topic and appeared to cherish the conviction that the whole world had conspired to contradict him lean ominous with a fierce intent brown face his sharp snapping jowl made him appear more like a mad fanatic than a sane and stately english peer 
the marvel was that a man with such a face should waste even his madness on irresponsible brawls and outrages it was like some fierce egyptian monk playing insane tricks in christian alexandria he saluted hortense with his usual air of restless eyed and explosive abruptness she had assumed her utmost graciousness her full feminine fascination my lord stared at her for a moment in his queer distrustful way and then turned to the figure in the silk cassock well you dull dog how are we to be amused to-night tom temple adopted a tone of the blandest deference we have founded a mission my lord for the conversion of unkissed females damnation boy there are none my lord of pembroke is a great authority am i who told you that i should like to talk with him a minute where are your converts eh by my soul i don't see many the bishop made an unctuous gesture with his open hands there are an innocent few my lord three pinafores and two aprons who's that there old purcell's widow she is as plump as a fat hen and the one there by the window who's she tom temple appealed to hortense and purcell's daughter a sour scratch your face looking wench zounds tom begin your mission there go and kiss her or i'll knock your head against the wall he laughed as though hugely tickled while the majority of the men who had been listening exchanged glances and divided their curiosity between the girl by the window my lord pembroke and bishop tom hortense had drawn aside and was bending over anne purcell there may have been a motive in the move possibly she did not wish to countenance the joke and yet desired to profit by the information she might gain thereby the bishop looked embarrassed if you will lend me your countenance my lord go and kiss her on oh, my conscience sir but he was drifting perilously near an argument and the mad peer's eyes began to sparkle the crowd settled itself to enjoy the drama why my lord bishop is a heretic the recusant the fifth monarchy maniac pull his bibs off tom temple found himself in the midst of a dilemma on the one hand was this silent swarthy-faced girl who looked as unapproachable as a minerva on the other my lord of pembroke ready to explode at the slightest opposition i accept your mandate my lord forward then sainted sir i am the church militant to support the conversion tom temple plucked up his impertinence and approached barbara with an air of grim solemnity all eyes were turned in her direction she found herself the sinecure of this mocking sneering mischief-loving crowd my daughter i am authorized by his majesty pope of whitehall and by my lord cardinal pembroke here to initiate you into the one true church are you my daughter in a fit and ready state to be converted barbara looked at the young man straight in the face and said nothing have you no answer for me my child my lord of pembroke gave him a push from behind do it tom or i'll convert her myself my lord cardinal i am ready to abdicate in your favour sophist kiss her and have done tom temple looked at barbara and found his expiring impudence unequal to the task a breeze of cynical laughter swept the room the three girls had left the card table and were standing huddled together giggling and glancing from barbara to the gentleman hortense and anne purcell had drawn aside toward the harpsichord while the sentimental widow seemed scared the church militant must intervene my lord of pembroke jostled the mock churchman aside and faced barbara she had risen and was standing at her full height an angry colour flooding into her face the peer and the lady looked each other in the eyes the man's cynical yet malicious stare humiliated her despite her wrath and her defiance her glance travelled over the faces that seemed to fill the room nowhere did she find a glimmer of pity or resentment she was just a silly prudish girl to them a sulky child to be teased a thing that piqued their cynical curiosity 
my lord of pembroke made a curt bow you will permit me to receive you into the bosom of our church he said she flashed a fierce stare at him and then drew back close to the window it was then that her eyes met the eyes of someone in the room someone who had been standing in the background and who was watching her with intense earnestness she recognized john gore a rush of appeal and of chivalrous sympathy seemed to leap from face to face my lord pembroke advanced a step there was something satanic about his eyes come little simpleton he stretched out his arm and caught her wrist roughly but she twisted it free gently my wild filly we must break you to harness come now he was shouldered aside abruptly with a vigour that set the whole room gaping at the thunderclap that would follow a shortish sturdy man with a brown imperturbable face had established himself calmly between my lord and barbara purcell it seems my lord that since you are all christians i am the only heathen in the room the retort came instantly with a sweep of the peer's arm john gore was ready for it and put the blow aside half a dozen gentlemen rushed in and made a human barrier between the pair my lord of pembroke struggled like a knot of fire half smothered by damp fuel let go my arm howard or by god i'll run my sword through you they tried to pacify him but his violent temper blazed through their words he looked madman enough as he spat his fury over the shoulders of those who held him back but for the inevitable steel the scene might have been ridiculous will you fight i am at your service my lord come then draw clear the room howard you are my second hortense's voice intervened with imperious feeling gentlemen not in my house stephen gore had pushed through and stood beside his son take me jack keep cool boy the fool's mad in the park then lad but it's raining torrents said someone peering through the window who the devil cares for rain tell my boys to light their links get me my cloak howard are you ready sir ready my lord said john gore we can use the swords we have that is my privilege i believe End of chapter nine